Now, of course, Job is a very, very famous story. Uh, most people who know the Bible even a little bit have heard the story of Job. And obviously, we just read here chapter 1. And uh, what I'm going to be preaching about this morning, just so you know where I'm going with everything, the title of my sermon is, Why Bad Things Happen to Good People. This is a question that a lot of people have. This is something that, that shakes the faith of many. This is something that, that gets people to, to not want to turn to God because we live in a world where people will see a lot of bad things happen. Now, I just came, as I mentioned earlier, um, a few days ago from my, my friend's funeral. My friend was 39 years old and he died. And a lot of his family, a lot of people you know, don't understand. How could this happen? You know, he was a great guy. Everybody loved him. You know, he, he was such a, a wonderful person to be around. How is it that, that something so bad can happen to him? And people can look at this with, with a, a negative view and a real bad viewpoint to the point to where, well, if God allows all these things to happen and I don't want, you know, I don't want to have anything to do with that God. And that's a wrong attitude to take. And, and a lot of times we don't understand, well, how can these things even happen, right? So we're going to go through, I, I have four different points on why bad things happen to good people. Now, when we say good people, we know the Bible says, you know, as is written, there is none, there is none good, no, not one. You know, we're all sinners. We all have broken God's law. So ultimately, when we, when we compare ourselves to, to goodness and righteousness, we all fall short. Now, that being said, there is a level of goodness that you can have. You know, there is there's a righteous way of living that we can have. And the Bible even talks about Job. And God was even kind of bragging on Job to Satan. When, when we see here in the story in chapter 1, you know, the Bible says that the sons of God presented themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came among them. And, and God mentions Job. He says, hey. Have you seen my servant Job? You know, he's, he's upright and he's perfect and you know, he's, he's doing all these good things. Now, when he says perfect, it, it's, it means complete. It doesn't mean he was sinless. Job was not sinless. Job had sin just like everybody else. But he was living a righteous life. He was even, you know, he was uh, worshiping the Lord and he was even getting up early and, and offering up sacrifices just for his children. He says, just in case any one of my children might have cursed God in their heart, I'm looking out for them. Job was a really good guy. He, had, he, had, he also had a lot of wealth. He was a wealthy man. We, we went through the whole list of, of all the oxen and, and animals and everything else that he owned. And he had a lot of children. He had seven sons and three daughters. And things were going really well for Job in his life. Even verse number one, it says, um, that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. So when you see someone like this who, who, God, who God is bragging and God's saying, wow, this is a great example of somebody on the earth that's doing well and doing right and serving the Lord. For bad things to happen to him, it's going to make a lot of people question and say, well, wait a minute, why are all these? And, you know, if you know the story, as you read the book of Job, you're going to see his three friends come in later. You know, his friends that are supposed to be there to comfort him as he's lost all of his wealth. He's lost all of his children. In chapter 2, the devil comes in and, and he smites them with, with a disease. So he has these boils and he's just itching and just miserable. And after losing everything, having this horrible disease to where people, his friends didn't even want to look on him, they're coming to comfort him and then all of a sudden... They start saying, oh, well, you must have been having some sin. You must have been doing something wrong, Job. You must have been doing something for God to bring this on you because there's no way any of this would have happened unless you were doing something bad. And that was false. And the Bible records at the very end of the book, God is angry with his friends. And he says, you know, Job needs to pray for you guys. He says everything that Job was saying was right and what the friends were saying was wrong. It was incorrect. They were, they were falsely accusing Job of having some kind of horrible sin in his life to bring all the bad things upon him. And that was not true. See, sometimes bad things can happen and it's not a result of your own actions. And this is what gets people caught. But see, Job had the right attitude. Because at the end of, ver of chapter number one, what we saw here, he said, you know, he, it says he rose, he rent his mantle, you know, he kind of ripped his clothing, which is something that they did when they were grieving in the Old Testament, and he shaved his head, and he fell down on the ground, and he worshipped. Now, can you imagine that? And, and think about the way that he received all of his news. It says, you know, as he was yet speaking. So the first guy comes and says, yeah, you know what, the Sabaeans, they came. 
and they killed all of your, you know, they, they took all of your stuff and all of your servants are dead and I'm the only one that made it out of there alive. And as he's telling them this story, another messenger's coming up and just hitting them, just boom, 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 everything, everything's gone. And then that last one, you know, all of his wealth is gone. And the last one saying, you know, all of your children were eating and drinking. And, and this whirlwind came and just destroyed the house and they're all dead. And I'm only allowed, made it out to come and tell you this after everything else. And you think about the circumstances, especially with this. One of them said the fire of God came down from heaven. Something that, how could you explain that? How would you think that that's anything other than God doing that to you? And have to have the, this whole series of events happening the way that it did, this would be a situation where I could understand someone thinking that, like, God, why are you doing this to me? I, could, I would understand that because of the, the extreme circumstances here especially. But what did Job do? He says he fell down on the ground and he worshipped. He worshipped God. He said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He didn't charge God foolishly. He didn't, he didn't blame God for anything that happened. He was humble and, and, and was still keeping his integrity to God and maintaining his faith towards God. And righteously, by the way, because it wasn't God doing these things to him. Satan is the one that was accusing Job falsely to God. And Satan is the one that brought this under this. Now, did God allow it to happen? Yes. But did God do all these things to Job? No. Satan is the one that was attacking. Satan is the one that we ought to be angry at, if anybody. Satan's the one that caused all the hurt and the pain. And the first point I want to say is, why do bad things happen to good people? Well, number one, it could be an attack from Satan. He's real. I mean, I don't know about you, but I believe the Bible. I don't think this book is just a book of fairy tales and stories that aren't real. And... and the devil or Satan is mentioned all throughout the Bible as being an angel of God who has fallen and, and sin was found in him and he does not want people to get saved and he just wants himself to be like God. This is who Satan is described as being. And he's wicked and he's evil and he attacks those, especially those that love God and are doing good and right by him. Satan is always trying to stop the goodness from spreading and stop the message of Jesus Christ and the gospel from being spread. So sometimes one of the reasons why bad things may happen to good people is because the devil is attacking. And that, is, that has nothing to do with, with God being bad or evil or, or someone that you need to turn away from. It has to do with the devil being wicked. Now turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 13. This is going to be the next place we're going to look. So sometimes bad things happen to good people because the devil's attacking you. And I'll just mention this now. We don't always know. I've got four different reasons why bad things happen to good people. We don't always know the reason why, for sure. You know, Job didn't know that Satan was attacking him at that time. He had no idea. You know, he went through all of it. We know because we get to read the Bible and we get to see that there's this conversation going on in heaven. And, and we, we see all of the truth here. God has revealed it unto us. But Job didn't know all that at the time. And when we have bad things maybe happening in our lives, we won't always know why it's happening. Sometimes you might be able to figure it out, but you won't always be able to know. Is Satan attacking me or is it one of these other reasons? Actually, you know, well, that's fine. You're in Acts 13. But um, another reason why bad things happen to, be good, to good people is because you may be having things coming from another person, just another individual out to do you harm. And you don't always have control of that. See, God has given us free will. God has given us, it's, it truly is a gift. He did not make us robots. He did not pre-program us to do all the things that we're going to do. And God is not here controlling us in our actions in what we do from day to day. God created us and gave us the ability and the will to choose. Are we going to do what's right or are we going to do what's wrong? 
We are not mindless robots. So in so doing that, because he gave us this free will and this ability, it's not just the free will to do good. There's the free will to do evil there also. We have the choice to make. Everybody has that choice to make. So if somebody else chooses to do harm to someone else, the ability is there for them to do that. And if God, think about this now too, because you could say, well, God is capable of doing anything. He's able of stepping in and stopping things from happening. Yes, he is. And you know, sometimes he does do that. But if he did that in every single instance, every time someone's going to do bad, would we really even have free will then? I mean, someone wouldn't really have the free will to do evil to someone else if it was just always stopped every single time. It was never able, allowed to happen. It, it would kind of not, not even be the, the will that he gave us to do. And, and what he does is, and I believe this, you know, God has much more of a hands-off approach to us. He's given us what we need. He's given us his word. He gives us pastors and teachers, and he gives us people to help be leaders and to do things. And he, he's given us the Holy Spirit, if you're saved today, if your faith is in Jesus Christ, to, to help to guide you and to know right from wrong. He's, he's given us consciences to understand the difference between right and wrong. He's given us the tools that we need, but ultimately he leaves it to us to determine what we're going to choose to do. So when people choose to do evil... They can do evil against someone who's doing good. And again, this is another instance where it's not the result or the fault of the person that has the bad things happening to them. One example we see from the Bible is King David. If you remember King David from the Old Testament, Acts 13.22 states that, uh, And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Now, was David perfect? No. We know that David had sin. He even had, he had a terrible sin of adultery, right, and murder. But God has, has spoken of David saying that he's a man after my own heart. The heart of David was, was like the heart of God. And he did a lot of very good things. And when you read throughout all the various kings, you read First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles in the Old Testament, you'll see he's kind of the standard of a king that did good and righteously in the sight of God. For him following the law, following God, and trying to do what's right. People were always referred back to him. When a king was doing good, they might say, you know, he did good, he followed God, but not like David his father. Not like David did, because David followed him really well. And um, he, was, he was kind of a, used as a standard in the Bible, someone who did good. David had a lot of success. He had faith in God. He was definitely blessed of God. Remember, he's the one that killed Goliath early on in his career, you know, before he became king. He had the faith and, and he ran up to Goliath, this great warrior, this giant. And David was just a youth. And he came to him, he had his sling. You know, Saul wanted to put all his armor on him. He's like, I, I can't wear this stuff. I, I, don't, I haven't proved it. I, don't, I haven't tested it. I don't, I don't know how it's going to do. Just let me go and do my thing because God's the one that's going to bring the victory. And God truly was the one that brought the victory. For him to, to kill that giant with one stone, when he nailed him right between the eyes, got him, he fell down dead. He did all the right things. He gave God the glory. And he, he even brought the battle to Goliath in the name of the Lord. He says, you know what? You've got your sword and your spear and you come to me defying God and defying the armies of Israel. He says, but I come to you in the name of the Lord. And you're going to see that, that God is real and God does exist. And God was with David and he wrought that great victory. And he was doing everything right. But what happened with David, right? After that great victory, um, I'll just read for you. If you want to turn to, you could turn to um, 1 Samuel 23. I'm going to read from 1 Samuel 18. Verse 7, and, and the women answered one another as they played and said, Saul hath slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. So they made this song about David after he killed Goliath, about Saul and David. Because after he killed Goliath, then they went and they, they, they destroyed the army of the Philistines. Because they turned around and ran when they saw that their champion was dead. And he, they went after him. And so... They come back into Jerusalem. They've got this great victory, right? Everyone's happy. They're starting to make these songs about him. And the song was made, remember, Saul's a king. And David was a nobody. 
Nobody knew who David was. David came in and he's the one that killed Goliath. So because he did that, they made this song where it says, Saul is saying his thousands and David is ten thousands. So they're elevating the status of David above Saul, above the king. And it says in verse 8, And Saul was very wroth, and the saying displeased him. And he said, They have ascribed unto David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed but thousands. And what can he have more but the kingdom? And Saul eyed David from that day and forward. So from that day, see, Paul was, Saul was envious of David because he's getting more accolades than him. But he was also nervous saying, okay, if the people love him so much, I'm the king. I mean, they ought to be respecting and reverencing me and looking to me. Now they have somebody else who is, who is a competitor that could be someone that's going to take the kingdom away from me. And Saul was getting nervous about losing his kingdom to David. Now, unrightfully so. He shouldn't have been worried about that because God was the one that ordained Saul to be king in the first place. He was the one that gave it to him. So Saul should have been looking to, to God to just establish the kingdom and for him to just do what's right and for him to trust in God and say, you know what? God's the one who chose me and I'm just going to keep doing what's right. And, and I'm not going to worry about these songs that these women made up about David. You know, it shouldn't have bothered him that much, but it did. And he envied them, and he was nervous about it. And as a result of that, you know, it started off, it said he eyed him from that day before. He had his eye on him real closely. And it got to the point to where Saul was continually trying to seek after and kill David. Because God was blessing David. The more he did, he was doing what's right. And Saul ended up making some mistakes. He was doing some things that displeased God and, and was not doing what he was supposed to be doing. And it says, in, if, you, if you turn to Saul, uh, or 1 Samuel 23, verse 14, the Bible says, And David abode in the wilderness in strongholds and remained in a mountain in the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul sought him every day. But God delivered him not into his hand. And David saw that Saul was come out to seek his life, and David was in the wilderness of Ziph in a wood. So David had to keep on being on the run and just going from camp to camp and just, just fleeing from Saul because Saul was after him every day to kill him. Now, mind you, David didn't do anything against Saul. And in fact, there were two times that David could have killed Saul. He had the, uh, the perfect opportunity to do so. But David righteously said, no, I'm not going to do it. He said, I'm not going to lift up my hand to God's anointed. God's the one that made him king. I'm not going to step in and kill him, even if he's coming after me to kill me. I'm not going to do that to him. Psalm 59 shows us how David felt when he was being pursued by Saul. So David is an example here, just to bring us back to the, to the main subject, of bad things happening to someone who's good. David was doing what was right. He was being blessed by God and all that he was doing, yet he's got the king himself coming after him and trying to kill him. But David is another example of someone who didn't charge God foolishly in saying, God, you know, giving up on God because all these bad things were happening to him. He continued to do the right things and to do that which was right and not to lose his faith. But the result, the, the problem was all these bad things were happening to David because of Saul. Because Saul was choosing to go after him. It's Saul's fault. It wasn't David's fault for what he had done. It was Saul that was coming after him and bringing bad things upon someone who was a good person. Psalm 59, David kind of reveals a little bit about, uh, about what he was going through and the problems that he was having because he was being pursued by Saul. It says in verse 1, Deliver me from mine enemies, O my God. Defend me from them that rise up against me. Deliver me from the workers of iniquity and save me from bloody men. For lo, they lie in wait for my soul. The mighty are gathered against me, not for my transgression, nor for my sin, O Lord. So he's saying right there, it's not, it's not because I've done anything against them. I haven't transgressed them. I haven't sinned. I haven't sinned against you, God, or against them. They are lying in wait and trying to kill me. He says, they run and prepare themselves without my fault. Awake to help me and behold. Thou therefore, O Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, awake to visit all the heathen. Be not merciful to any wicked transgressors. Selah. So David goes and he seeks God's help. He says, you know what? All these bad things are happening unto me. And you know, what we need to take away from this sermon, one of the main points is that 
as we go through, we've got two more to go through of, of why bad things happen to good people. We see in the first two examples here, righteous, godly men, Job and David, and they both turned to God. They didn't turn away from God. When the bad times happen, hey, who else are you going to turn to? The Lord is, is, is our rock and our strength and our shield and our comfort. We need to be going to him. The last thing you need to be doing when things are going bad against you is to turn away from the Lord. He is there, and, and God did protect him because Saul didn't end up killing him. Now, he, he, he really wore him down to the point where he was just about ready to give up. But he put his faith and his trust in God, and God protected him all the way through. One of the third reasons, now turn if you would to Galatians chapter 6 in the New Testament. So we've seen sometimes Satan may be attacking you. There's a reason why good, bad things happen to good people. Other people can be attacking you. And it's through no fault of your own. They're just choosing to do bad. They're choosing to do harm. But another reason why bad things may happen to you know, good people is you may end up reaping what you've sown. And the Bible says in Galatians chapter 6, verse number 7, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. The things that we do in this life will come back around and get us if, if it's bad, right? If we, sow, if, we, if we sow, it says, to the flesh, if we do the things that, that are bad, that, that are the lusts of the flesh, it's going to come back around on us. God is going to make sure we, we are recompensed appropriately for the things that we do. And likewise, though, if you do good things, he says, hey, that's going to come back around also. So it's a two-way street. It could be good, it could be bad. But notice he uses the reference of a man sowing a seed. When you sow a seed in the ground, it doesn't spring up overnight. That's something that gets, it gets planted, and it could even be forgotten about. And it's not until months later or maybe years later before it actually grows and comes back. In, in a visible form that you can see. It's the same way with our sin. You may sin when you're younger and, and start doing things that are wicked and bad in the sight of God and seemingly get away with it, right? Nothing bad seemed to happen. You know, I did all this stuff. And, and people tend to live their lives this way, unfortunately, where they look at you know, the things that they do and then immediately are looking to see did something good or bad happen to try to justify or, or you know, um, Show them whether or not what they did was really bad or not. And they live their life that way, and, and they, they have their, a sh too short-sighted of a vision. Because oftentimes when people do bad, it doesn't come back around to them again right away. It may take months, years even, before, something, before it ends up coming back, the things that they have done, the wickedness that they had sown, because it's just like a seed. It'll come back. And just like a seed, it starts off small, but when it comes back and it grows, it's a lot bigger. You know, the Bible talks about sowing to the wind and reaping the whirlwind. You know, you sowed to the wind, just, just, just a breeze, and then when it comes back to you, it's like a tornado. It comes back in full force. And we need to be aware of this. But being aware of this also, so when bad things happen to you, you may have done wickedness previously in your life, and now you're living, you know, you're, you've, you've gotten right, you're, you're, you're trying to do right, you're reading the Bible, you're trying to do what's right in the eyes of the Lord, you're trying to help people out, you're trying to do all these good things, and then all of a sudden something bad comes along and happens to you. Now it may be a result of one of the first two reasons, but it may be the reason that you are just simply reaping what you've sown because you've done things in your life that are bad and now it's finally caught up to you and it's coming back. Now, this is the attitude that I think that we need to have in our lives. While number one and number two are completely true and they happen, I have a tendency to think that, you know, when things happen to me, I usually will look at myself first. I'm not going to first just automatically assume it's Satan attacking me or the result of someone else's bad. Well, I'm going to think, you know what, what did I do that's bad? And, and it's a humble attitude that we need to have because we want to just make sure that we're not being too proud in thinking that everything that I do is right and I'm always right all the time. And if something bad ever happens to me, it's because someone else did it. 
You know, we, we need to maintain the humility to just being able to, to inflect and, and look on ourselves and say, you know what, yeah, I've done wrong before. And maybe there's things that you haven't confessed unto God and just, and just said, you know, God, I'm sorry about these things. And, uh, and, and kind of gotten your heart right with, with, with things that you've done in the past that, that you need to do. But um, you may not always realize that you are reaping what you've sown. It doesn't happen right away. Now, my last point, it's going to be a shorter sermon this morning, but my last point is going to be, if you want to turn to Exodus chapter 20, besides reaping what you've sown, sometimes good thing, bad things can happen to good people as a result of your parents and what they've sown. There are sins that the Bible talks about where, where evil will come upon the children as a result of what the parents have done. And in Exodus chapter 20, Exodus 20 is a chapter that, that goes through the Ten Commandments. And in verse number 4 of Exodus 20, we're going to see here, the Bible reads, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity, listen to this, visiting the iniquity of the fathers, upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. God visits the iniquity of the, of the... I mean, I believe every word of this Bible to be true. So when the Bible says, hey, the sins of the fathers, and, and, and this specific sin too, it's not for every sin. And we'll see that too because the, the few times that this, that this reference comes up, he visits the sin of the parents unto the third and fourth generation. He says, of them that hate me. Why do they hate him? Because they're building false gods and bowing down and worshiping a different God other than the Lord. And they're forsaking God. And basically what happens is that when people decide to forsake God and create their own God and bow down and worship a false God, God will end up rejecting them because they've rejected him. And he says, fine. And, and you know who suffers as a result of that? Their children are going to suffer. And it's a consequence that happens. And we need to, to take this into consideration. Anytime we say, every time a person sins, you may think you're only impacting yourself, but that's not true. Every time a person sins, it impacts somebody else. There's always someone else involved. No matter what you think you're doing, that you think this is only impacting me. Wrong. It's always going to impact other people, whether you realize it or not. There's always people looking to you. You know, if you're a father or someone in a, in a position, if someone knows you're a Christian, there's going to be people looking on you. And when they start seeing you getting into sin, you say, oh, well, it's only affecting me. Well, no, now it's going to bring a bad name upon Jesus Christ and upon you as a Christian. And someone's going to say, oh, well, if that's what a Christian is, I don't want to have anything to do with that. This is a good example. Exodus 34, if you're in Exodus 20, you can flip over to chapter 34. We see another reference here about God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children. Verse number 6, Exodus 34, the Bible reads, And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. Now, I love that that, that section starts off with, with how much God is long-suffering and merciful and gracious and He's there and He's forgiving because all those things are true. But what we don't want to do is end up pushing God so far to where, you know, even with all this forgiveness and everything else, where we just say, you know what, God, I don't want anything to do with you. I'm just going to make up my own God. Because that makes God angry. And that's gonna, he's going to visit the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children in the third and fourth generation. And um, I'll read for you from 2 Kings. There was a king named Manasseh. And if you know the history of the, you know, the Old Testament and the, and the nation of Israel, the nation of Israel was around for a long time, for hundreds of years, and they had kings that would reign in, uh, in Judah and in Israel. And then um, they ended up forsaking God. 
And then they were taken into captivity by the Babylonian Empire. The, Babylon, the Babylonians came in and they conquered the Israelites and they took them captive into the land. And the reason why that even happened is because they forsook God. There was this really wicked king named Manasseh and he ended up bringing this judgment upon the entire nation. So we're going to see here the sins of one man was brought repercussions upon everybody. Because this guy did so much against the Lord that God had to judge the nation. Now, obviously, he's not the only sinner there, or the only one doing wickedness. There's a lot of people doing wickedly. But Manasseh and the sins of Manasseh are referenced as being something that God could not just let go. And in 2 Kings 21, verse 10, I'll start reading for you. The Bible says, And the Lord spake by his servants, the prophets, saying, Because Manasseh, king of Judah, hath done these abominations... And hath done wickedly above all that the Amorites did, which were before him. And hath made Judah also to sin with his idols. And don't forget that. We, we, we already read from the Ten Commandments of people setting up idols and worshiping false gods. Manasseh was causing the people to worship idols. It says in verse 12, Therefore thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing such evil upon Jerusalem and Judah, that whosoever heareth of it, both his ears shall, shall tingle. He's saying, you know, people aren't even going to want to hear this. When, when, they, when they find out all the bad things are going to happen now as a result of their sin. Verse number 13, And I will stretch over Jerusalem the line of Samaria and the plummet of the house of Ahab, and I will wipe Jerusalem as a man wipeth a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. And I will forsake the remnant of mine inheritance and deliver them into the hand of their enemies. And they shall become a prey and a spoil to all their enemies. Because they have done that which was evil in my sight and have provoked me to anger since the day their fathers came forth out of Egypt, even unto this day. Moreover, Manasseh shed innocent blood very much till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to another beside his sin wherewith he made Judah to sin in doing that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. So besides all of the other sins that Manasseh was responsible for and the idolatry, he also caused innocent blood to be shed. And the way that he did that was they were offering up children as a sacrifice unto these false gods. They were causing children to pass through the fire. Their own children. A living sacrifice unto these false gods. Pure wickedness. Shedding the blood of innocence. He said, you know, God, God's like, I'm not going to overlook this. this. Judgment needs to happen because you guys are doing so wickedly. It's going to happen. And Manasseh was the one who really brought all of that about. Now, after the reign of Manasseh, there rose up Josiah. It was Manasseh's grandson. He rose up and he was a righteous king and he was doing all this great work for God. But no, and, and he was a king that, that was unlike all the other kings before him in serving God and doing what was right. But even though he did all of those things that were right, because Manasseh was so bad, God says, I am not going to, to turn away from, this, from the judgment that needs to happen. He said, it's still going to happen because what Manasseh did was so bad, the judgment has to come. In 2 Kings 23, verse 25, the Bible reads, And like unto him was there no king before him, talking about Josiah, that turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his might, according to all the law of Moses, neither after him arose there any like him, notwithstanding... The Lord turned not from the fierceness of his great wrath wherewith his anger was kindled against Judah because of all the provocations that Manasseh had provoked him withal. So here's an instance of bad things happening upon people, even upon people under the reign of King Josiah, who was a righteous king and he was finally doing what was right. But because of all these bad things that have happened, the judgment is still coming. And, and the people were still taken captive. It was too little, too late to, 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 to satisfy um, what needed to happen in God's eyes in the coming judgment. And honestly, I think we're in a similar situation today. I think of all the innocent blood that is being shed through abortions in this country in the millions. Millions of innocent babies losing their lives and the blood being shed... God's well aware of all of this that's going on, way more than we are. God is the creator of life. When that life is formed in the womb, God's the one that gives that baby life. And those lives are being stamped out on a daily basis. 
And the judgment is going to come. And I fear that even if we were to turn back to God somehow and have this great revival, it probably won't be enough because of all of the wickedness that's already happened. When we live in a culture that just embraces sin, I mean, it doesn't look like it's going to happen anytime soon of, the, of America coming back and, and restoring faith in God. I mean, if anything, it's just becoming more and more godless. Throwing out uh, the Bible out of the schools, out of the courtrooms, out of everything. No one wants to have anything to do with God. And just exalting sin and the, the gay pride and coming out and just saying, hey, just accept everything. You need to accept everything because, you know, we just need to love everybody. When the Bible says these things are wicked and abominable, we need to cast it out as sin and say, we're not going to tolerate that. But when we live in a, you know, God's judgment is coming. And, and you know, that's not, a, that's not a great message. It's not a positive message. But we have to realize that as well. It is going to happen. And you know what? There are going to be some, some good people that suffer as a result of all the wickedness that other bad people have done. But we can't ever look to God and, and complain and, and charge God foolishly for what we might go through. Because it's not God's fault. Hey, God created everything perfect. God, God created the, the Garden of Eden. He created everything so that we wouldn't have to do anything. We were well taken care of. It's not His fault. The only thing you could fault Him with is giving us the ability to choose. And not being a pre-programmed robot just doing everything the way that, that God said you have to do things. And I'm not going to charge God with that. He gave us the option. He gave us the free will. We screwed it up. And as a result, there are consequences. But, you know, sometimes in this world, bad things happen to good people. It happens. And, and it's unfortunate. Obviously, it's never a good thing. You know, no one likes going through bad things ever. But, but hopefully, if those things do happen to you or to someone that you love, Remember that there are many reasons why these things happen and none of them are God's fault. If God needs to bring judgment because innocent blood's being shed, well, I mean, that has to happen. It's not God's fault. It's the fault of the, the, the people murdering their babies. You know, if, if, if Satan is attacking you, it's not God's fault that Satan is evil. If someone else is attacking you, it's not God's fault. They're the ones choosing to do bad. And if you have done bad in your life and you end up reaping what you've sown, that's not God's fault either. None of these things are God's fault, but they're all explanations of why bad things can happen. And I'll just leave you with this. You know, some, something to think about when bad things do start to happen. Before you get angry at God, most people will consider themselves to be good people. I mean, most people I talk to, for sure, I mean, very few will say, actually, I'm a bad person. And there are a few that will say that. There are some people that say, you know what, I'm, I'm, bad. I'm a bad guy. And, um, and they're, they're, being, they're trying to be honest with themselves, right? But, um, but most people, you say, and, and I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but just ask yourself this question. Do you consider yourself to be a good person? Because I would think that probably most people would say, yeah, I'm, I'm a pretty good person. You know, I try to help people out. But then think, have you ever done something bad to someone in your life? I mean, just think about the course of your life and, and things that you might have done that you might be ashamed of right now. Have you ever done anything bad to someone, either physically, emotionally, so, you know, someone where you hurt someone and it wasn't their fault and you did something bad? I, I could say that I've done that. Now, if I can say, if I could consider myself to be a pretty good person and I have done something like that, it's not that hard to figure out that well, someone very easily can just be doing the same thing back to me. And it's, and it's not a result of them being wicked or even God being the, the, the responsible person for that. But when bad things happen to us, a, a, good, a good thing to keep in mind and to keep us humble is just think, hey, haven't I done something bad to someone before? Probably. I mean, prob I, I probably everybody has. I'd be surprised to meet someone who says, I have never, ever once lifted one finger done anything against somebody else that they, you know, they didn't deserve it. Now, a lot of people might try to justify the things that they do that are bad or, bad or wrong. But, you know, I'll just, I'll leave that with you to have that, that open heart. But hopefully this will help you when, you know, it, when, when bad things do happen that we can see, you know, there's many reasons why it happened. We don't always know the reasons. 
We don't know. But there are, there are legitimate reasons, and none of them are God's fault. So let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for loving us and being long-suffering and merciful, dear God. We pray that you would please just help us to get through the tough times that we have when, when attacks come our way or when, when a lot of bad things might happen, that we can have an attitude like Job. Lord, what a faithful and patient man to be able to, to take everything that, he, that had happened to him and all the emotion that goes along with that and losing loved ones and still be able to fall on his face and worship you and not be bitter against you, dear God. I pray that you please help us all to, to get to that point to where we can love you and honor you and respect you and serve you. Regardless of the circumstances that are going on around us, that we would be able to, through good times and bad times, always be able to maintain our faith and our integrity towards you, dear God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.